Good morning, church. My name is Raquel. I'm the office administrator here at Bethel, and I have the pleasure of giving you announcements this morning. The first thing on the list is that um, is giving, and so if that's something that the Lord has laid on your heart, then we encourage you to just go forth with that. Um, if you are here within the building, then we have the machines right over by the Connect desk, um, and any one of us can help you out with that if necessary. Um, also on our website under the donate option or the giving option, um, you can go ahead and click that and it'll lead you through the prompts. Um, second thing is our in touch cards, which is just a way for us to be able to connect with you. If you're looking to get in touch with a pastor for any reason, or if you wanted to get in touch with me for any reason, that's a great way to do it. So, um, so it'll be under contact on, on the website, or if you again are within the building, um, right on the backs of the chairs, uh, there's a QR code, you just scan it with your phone and that'll lead you to where you need to go. Um, and we also have paper forms at the Connect Desk if you're old school like myself. Um, next thing on the docket, uh, the News Bay camps are coming up. Um, so we have the kids camps and then also the Legacy Camp for seniors. So if that's something that might be really exciting to you, you can check them out at newsbaycamp.ca. Um, and then also on July 2nd, so next Saturday, um, Pastor Joe is leading a team out there to help out with some of the stuff they're trying to prepare for, for these camps coming up. If that's something that might excite you um, to be involved with, then please show up at the church parking lot at 8 a.m. next Saturday, July 2nd, and we can go ahead with that. And the last thing that we have is the church picnic is today, which is super exciting. So come on down to Transfer Beach at 1230. Um, we're going to have ice cream. We're going to have games for the kids. We just ask that everybody bring their own lunch um, and a lawn chair to sit in. And we're going to meet at the Kinsman Shelter. Yeah, around 1230, wherever you can get there. And we'll be there to have fun. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Pastor Joe here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, would you just join me in a word of prayer before we dive in? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your continual grace towards us. Father, I pray that as we look at your word, um, that you would speak to us, Father, that you would open um, our hearts to hear what your spirit is saying, that, they that we would be responsive and receptive. Father, we push any agendas outside uh, the door, and we ask that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Right on. So, three weeks three verses, an entirely different perspective. That was the bold and ambitious promise at the beginning of our Money Talks series. Money back, guaranteed. So the, our first week, I'm just going to give you start by giving you a little bit of a recap here. Our first week we talked about the meaning of money and how the meanings that we give to money actually uh, give it a godlike power that can enslave us. Right? If you're looking to, to money to be the source of your happiness or your security, two things that only God himself can provide, then you have replaced God with another master. And our verse uh, for, for that week is a direct quote from Jesus in Matthew 6, 24, where it says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And so if you're trying to memorize that, uh, I would just memorize that last bit. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. The second verse is all about managing money, right? It's, it's financial advice for your soul. It's not talking about, um, you know, I'm not playing the role of a financial advisor. Instead, what I'm saying is, look, here's what the Bible says about how to approach money from a values-based perspective. And our verse for that was the simple, yet deeply profound, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Godliness with contentment is great wealth. And today's verse is all about making your money count. How do you know that you're investing your money in something that will give a good return, in something that will last? And once again, if last week was financial advice for your soul, think of this as investing advice for your soul. We're not talking about stocks or options or mutual funds here, but there's definitely going to be some compounding interest. 
And our verse for this morning comes from a pastoral talk from the Apostle Paul in which he charged the Ephesian elders. He says, And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. And then he quotes Jesus here. It is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, when we were kids, my dad would repeat this one-liner of Jesus is every Christmas. And we would just like roll our eyes like, yeah, okay, dad, whatever. You know, <laughs> it's kind of hard um, to really wrap your mind around generosity as a kid, especially when, you know, you've, you've been circling toys in the Sears catalog uh, since October. And I, I think even as adults, it's hard to wrap our minds around generosity. Right? We all ad admire the generous. There's a part of us that, that even wants to imitate the generous, to be like them. But there always seems to be lots of excuses um, that get in the way of being generous. I think one of the big ones is just the sense of being overwhelmed that leads to skepticism. Right? With every church, sponsor child program, not-for-profit, foundation, and supermarket till asking us to donate, it's hard to know who we can trust, right? We've all heard the, the stories of not-for-profit CEOs, you know, making millions of dollars and celebrity pastors wearing shoes that cost more than most people make in a month, right? How do we know that if we, we donate our money to something that it's actually going to get to the need? It's actually gonna do what um, is promised to us. But the second big reason, and I would argue the biggest reason of all, is that our standard of living demands so much of us, right? We've been convinced by the propaganda of advertising that wants are actually needs and our desires are really necessities. And so with spending so much on ourselves, we have little to no margin to be generous. And I get it, like, like your money goes towards your bills and I, once you've kind of made it through that, there's only a little bit of money left. And what you do with that money really matters. And for all of our, our hesitancy, for all of our skepticism, for all of our, our thinking we can't afford it, for whatever reason you have that, that holds you back from being generous, if we look around us, there is a need for more generosity, not less. In a world that constantly takes and takes, one of the most life-giving things that we can do is to give. And so let's start by asking the obvious question. What is generosity? You know, when I, I think when many people think about a generous person or generosity, they often think of the big time philanthropists who make the news headlines, right? People like Bill Gates. Uh, as founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates is, uh, worth, has a net worth of $130.3 billion. Um, but he doesn't hoard all of that wealth for himself. Bill and his former wife, Melinda, have given away over $50 billion to charities and causes, not the least of which is the cause to eradic eradicate polio and malaria. But we have to ask ourselves, you know, is this, is this how you measure generosity? Is generosity measured by the dollar amount, by the amount that you give? Right? What about the person who's living in abject poverty who shares his last bit of food with a stranger? Who's more generous? Right? There is a lot more to generosity than just giving large sums of money. Um, David Hazard, the late General Secretary Treasurer of our fellowship, he passed last year. He wrote this, Generosity is so much more than the giving of finances. It is the tangible expression of a mature heart and healthy spirit that seeks the benefit of others. I think that's a pretty solid definition. Generosity is not measured um, by how much you, you give. Generosity is a joyful sacrifice, placing the needs of others before yourself before your, your wants, your desires, and even sometimes our needs. Generosity is more of a, a heart issue than it is a wallet issue. Now that said, 
It's far more than good intentions. It's not enough just to intend to be generous or want to be generous or to be compelled with compassion or moved. You actually have to open your wallet or open your home or open your heart to others. David Hazard went on to write, Generosity is also understood to be more than a social investment as it does not seek anything in return. Now, there's three different types of givers in this world. Okay, there's, 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 first of all, there's the truly altruistic people, the generous who give because it's the right thing to do, right? The, the thought of receiving any, any social or emotional benefit in return doesn't even factor in to the equation. They give because it's the right thing to do. The second type of giver, and we've all met this, this type of giver, is the person who gives looking for something in return, right? Uh, and their payment isn't monetary payment. It's something that takes the form of recognition of others, status, leverage, right? They want to be able to control things. They want to be able to control an organization or a person, right? Or maybe much more innocently, they just enjoy the emotional high that comes from giving. This is not generosity. They're not looking to give a gift. They're looking for a trade. And so my challenge to you is if you're this type of giver, to deeply introspectively take a look at your heart. Now there's a third type of giver, and this is where I think most of us land. The third type of giver is a mix of the first two. Right? They have a desire to give and to help others but they also kind of want to be noticed. They want to be recognized for it. They want something in return. And Jesus talked about this tension that we all face in Matthew 6, verses 3 to 4. He says this, But when you give to someone in need, don't let, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. See, when we give to get, we have missed the point of generosity. You know, I think it also needs to be said that generosity is a lifestyle, not just a momentary act. You can be generous with far more than money. In fact, just before the, the Apostle Paul quoted Jesus' words, it's more blessed to give than to receive, he says this, I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. See, Paul was not a rich man. He was a, a traveling missionary and church planter and apostle. And he worked a second job so he wouldn't put any undue burden on the people who were supporting him. He didn't just give of his money. He gave of his, his time. He gave of his, his, himself freely to expound the good news of Jesus. His life was given in service to others. And in the same way, we can be generous with our time and talents. Volunteering at your local church, hey, there's a plug for you right there, or for a cause that you believe in. You can be generous with your possessions, opening up your home to others, lending to others freely um, without expecting anything in return. So what is generosity? It's the tangible expression of a mature heart and a healthy spirit that seeks the benefit of others. Let me give you a story to illustrate. Sometimes a story is easier to grab a hold of than a definition. Generosity is, is one of our values here at Bethel. And we have some truly generous people. And the last three years for a church, um, if I'm going to be honest, has been very financially draining. We've faced one difficulty and then another and then another and then another. And through it all, God has been incredibly faithful. Um, his, his people have remained faithful. Many have gone above and beyond sacrificially giving to um, provide for the, the needs of the church so we can keep you know, spreading the gospel and helping people in need and doing all of those things. But if I can be completely upfront with you, this last unexpected roof of prayer that our church is facing has put a significant financial strain on the church. And, and seeing kind of 
the, the future laid out before us, the board knew it was time to make some quick course corrections. Um, and so we made several difficult financial decisions. And the most difficult one that we had to make was to temporarily reduce our missions giving until things could stabilize a little bit. And I know that's really hard to hear because I know that you have a heart for missions. Missions is, is one of our, our values as a church. And I want to assure you that we are continuing to give generously, um, even in this season. We're continuing to give a, a little bit more than um, maybe rationally we should because we believe in the value of generosity and we believe that we need to be giving um, as much as we possibly can. So we're being stretched. We haven't left our mission partners high and dry, but we've reduced it a little bit. And in order to communicate this, we sent letters to our mission partners just reaffirming our love for them, reaffirming that we're, we're here with them, that once things are better, we're going to increase giving again, and just explaining the financial situation that we're in. And one of our mission partners, when they received this letter, they ran upstairs to their, to their spouse and, and he's like, I've got I to gotta tell you something. But before he could, she said, hang on, we have to do our devotions. So they sat down and they did their devotions together. And guess where they read? They read from Acts 20, verse 35, the same passage that I'm preaching on. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And after that, they, they prayed, they read the letter, Sorry, they read the letter and they, they prayed about it. And they both decided that the best way to respond was to give to the church. And so they sent a response to us saying that they were moved by our letter, that they're here with us, that God's got us, and they donated to our building fund. That is generosity. Giving joyfully giving more than you can afford, giving when it doesn't make sense, but giving because that is the kind of person that you are. It's the tangible expression of the mature and healthy spirit that seeks the benefit of others. Generosity is not defined by how much you give or by how many people are watching. It's defined by a heart of self sacrificial love. Giving not so that we can get, not giving so we'll feel good, not giving because we were told to or guilted into it, but giving for the benefit of others. And as a church, we believe truly that generosity has the power to transform lives. And it's a bold statement, but we believe it enough to make it one of our values. So let's take a second and talk about why it is more blessed to give than to receive. So first, let's take a look at how generosity blesses us. Right? While we're, we're to give expecting absolutely nothing in return, paradoxically, generosity does far more for the giver than for the receiver. It is truly more blessed to give than to receive. You know, there's a story about a preacher who saw a homeless person on the sidewalk. And, and filled with compassion, he, he reached into his, his wallet and, and gave the man some money. And there was a bystander who was watching nearby. And he came over to educate the preacher. He said, you know that that money that you gave him is just going to be used for alcohol or, or drugs. Like, you, you probably did more harm than good by doing that. The preacher looked at him and he said this, I did not give for him only, but also for myself. I believe that he was on to something there. Generosity loosens the grip of greed on our souls. It floods our heart with compassion and joy. You know, perhaps the, the best way to think but what generosity does for us is to use a farming metaphor. You know, when we first moved here, my, my family went exploring down Yellow Point Road, and there's all kinds of um, amazing farms there that you can go and visit. But we went and we visited this one farm, and they had many goats that the kids could pet and feed, and they had, you know, chickens and all these different things. And one of the things that they had was a little store. 
where you could buy things and they were selling garlic. And I learned that the farm was known for their award-winning music garlic, which was really interesting because one, I didn't know they, that there were different types of garlic to begin with, or B, that there were awards for garlic. And I don't know really how you determine what the best garlic is, but uh, apparently they had it. So anyways, he said that it takes, he, what he does every year is he, he harvests his crop of garlic and then he goes through it and he takes the best cloves of garlic, the very best, and he stores them away and uses them for seed for the next year. He sacrifices immediate profit in order to have a fuller and better quality harvest next year. Or to use financial language, he invests it. And this is precisely what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6. When he writes this, he says, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. And then he goes on to say a few verses la later in verse 10, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Now, instead of a harvest of generosity, the original Greek actually uses the word diakosuna or righteousness. And so, what Paul's getting at here is one more generous. God produces a harvest of righteousness in us. Paul's talking about uh, being generous in all areas of our lives, not just being generous financially. When we trust God with our finances, God blesses us not only by providing for our needs, but also by creating a lifestyle of generosity within us. We will fi suddenly find ourselves being more generous in our relationships, in good works, in love, and on and on it goes. And this is why I like to say, you know, we don't have to give, we get to give. Right? We don't give because God will bless us. We don't give because it will produce a harvest of righteousness. We don't give because we have to. We give because it is the right thing to do. The second thing that we need to talk about is what generosity does for others. How does generosity bless other people? Now this one's pretty self-explanatory here, right? It should go without saying that generosity meets very real needs. So the simplest and shortest point is also the main point of generosity. When we are generous, it can cause those who lack to have bread and have their needs cared for. Right? When we are, are told that it's more blessed to give than to receive, it does not negate the blessing of receiving. You know, as a kid, you know, going back to my dad telling me it's more blessed to give than receive and eyes rolling into the back of my head, my problem was is that I thought in order to enjoy giving, which I did, but to really truly realize it's more blessed to give than receive, I needed to somehow enjoy getting less. But that's simply not true. You don't value something else more by intentionally putting something else down. You value something by raising it up. And so, just as being generous loosens the grip of greed on us, being on the receiving end of generosity can curb your pride. When we received the response from, from our mission partners, I was, I was humbled, I was honored, to be honest with you, I cried. Right? I just I felt so blessed. It was a witness, it was a testimony that God has us, that He's taking care of us. And so when we talk about investing your money by being generous, there's this compound interest effect that happens. Right? When you're generous towards others, they in turn will also have a desire to be generous because they know what it feels like to have been on the receiving end of generosity. And when you're generous, 
You're going to be, be blessed. You're going to realize how freeing and life-giving it is. And then you too are going to want to continue to be generous. It has a compound interest effect. Never underest a simple act of generosity. So how do you make your money count? How do you invest it wisely? And all of the different things that you can put your money towards, why be generous? Well, in the words of Jesus, again, we, we read them the first, our first week together. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Seek first his kingdom, and all of this will be added to you. Don't worry about all the things. It said, seek God's kingdom first. You know, at the end of the day, we're generous because we serve a generous God. The most self-sacrificial act of generosity ever was accomplished on the cross. Jesus gave of himself freely. But not only that, the Father gave of himself freely. In John 3.16 it says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved that he gave. We can be generous because God is generous. We love because he first loved us. We were undeserving. We had nothing to gain. But he gave so that we could be set free and transformed and renewed. To have our lives turned around and to be made completely new. And yet so often, so often we don't allow ourselves to be recipients of his grace. We don't allow ourselves to be, to receive his generosity, be lavished upon by him. You know, we're, we're willing to, to accept salvation. We're saying, you know what, Jesus died for me. That's overwhelming, but you know what, I'll, I'll take it because I really need it. But then in other areas of our lives, we're like, you know what, God, I think I can do this on my own. It's okay. Like, no, don't worry about it. No, no. We, we put up this false humility, and we all know what false humility is. False humility is pride. And here's the thing that you really need to understand. This is, this is, if you've forgotten everything else I've talked about today, I want you to remember this, okay? Your inability to receive from God hinders your ability to be generous. How can you be generous with others if you don't know what it's like to be on the receiving end of generosity? And how can you be extravagantly generous above and beyond, out of this world, crazy generous if you haven't experienced that kind of generosity from our Savior. And so if you you want to be more generous, you need to allow God to be generous towards you. If you're, you're too prideful to receive His grace, you won't be able to give with pure motives. Instead, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be trying to give in order to elevate your status in order to be a better person, to be more worthy of his love. But God's love has nothing to do with worthiness. God's love has to do with grace. God's love has to do with generosity. God's God's love has nothing to do with our deserving it and everything to do with who he is. So, You need to understand, don't give to get. Said give because you have received freely. When we rest in the grace of God, it overflows, it it overwhelms, it bubbles up into a life that delights in being generous. And that is when we can truly say it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to start with a posture of repentance. I pray that you would forgive us for the times where we have been 
stingy or prideful or just too focused on ourselves to see the need in front of us. Lord, I pray that you would make us truly generous people. Generous people not so we can get anything, but simply so we can bless others. No strings attached. I pray that you would, you would transform us and transform the people that we give to. Make us a truly generous people. In your mighty name. Amen.